Robert, I think. Oh. I forgot Bingo. it does that. <laughs> okay. Um, well, so the meeting's being recorded. Uh, I will share my screen now. Okay. Can you guys see that? Yes. Great. Okay. So I'm just going to go from the beginning. All right. So, um, welcome for those of you who are here. <laughs> um, this is uh, it's going to be a brief kind of 30 minute uh, presentation on a kind of introduction to all that you need to know as an elder on Haida Gwaii uh, or, or elsewhere, but that's kind of where we're, we're pitching this for. Um, how to, I guess, safely navigate and stay safe and build confidence on the internet. Um, so it's a part of the iPads for Elders program, um, which is, is supported by the CHN and School District 50. Um, and um, yeah, I think what we're going to do is, is talk for about 30 minutes. Um, at the end, um, there, there might be one or two questions, but uh, I guess it's important to say that this is going to be recorded. And so if you are watching the recording of it after the fact, uh, we'll provide a bit of contact info uh, for getting in touch with people uh, in the program if you do have any other questions after the fact. So um, I'll give you my email address and some other kind of contacts that you can reach out to if you have questions about anything to do with, with things we go over. Okay, so, uh, so since everybody's been indoors and COVID uh, has been on our radars, uh, there has been a fairly sharp rise in uh, the occurrence of online scams and fraud in general. Um, and that's, I think, in part because a lot of people are working from home and spending more time on their computers. Um, so for, for scammers and, and fraudsters and people who, who would um, kind of want to gain access to your computer or information, uh, there's just kind of more opportunity than ever. So this is kind of the, the need to think about online safety and uh, how, how, how to stay safe online. I guess it's kind of never been more important than ever, especially if you're relatively new to using the internet. Um, so yeah, there's been an increased use of computers. That's true on Haida Gwaii as, as anywhere else. Um, and unfortunately, I think uh, over the past year or two, um, as uh, I was hoping that uh, Vaughn knew might be able to join us from um, Northern Savings, but um, he is understandably otherwise occupied because he's expecting a baby soon. Um, they, uh, there's been a, a real kind of surge in uh, elderly people and in First Nations communities in particular, being targeted by online fraud. Um, so um, Haida Gwaii being Haida Gwaii, I think it's extra important that people stay diligent. Um, and, um, and so that way, the internet doesn't need to be a source of anxiety. Um, it doesn't need to be something that uh, you avoid because you're scared of kind of being caught in a trap of some sort. Um, and, you know, and if you do encounter, uh, uh, if you do fall into a situation where you feel like your information is being compromised or you just feel some sort of online threat has emerged, um, I think it's important to just sort of emphasize that the best thing you can do is report it. Again, at the end of this, I'll, I'll, I'll provide a couple more uh, contacts for, you know, where you can report that. Um, but it, that's an important part of, of, I guess, of staying, staying safe is just making, making your uh, uh, experiences known so that we can keep track of it um, and build up a, a kind of more, a better sense of what is happening locally. Um, so there's a couple um, major types of, of online fraud, of, of, of scams that people 
encounter online uh, more often than not. Um, so I'll just go over some of these in the next two slides. Uh, we've got an example of it in the next slide, but for now I'll just kind of outline what these things are. Um, so the, the first one is called phishing uh, with a PH. Um, I'm not really sure why the PH spelling, I've never really known, um, but that is the way it's spelt. Um, phishing is something I think a lot of people will have encountered, not necessarily with that name, but um, it's fairly familiar. It, and it basically involves getting some sort of unsolicited mail. And, and that could be, it could be physical mail, but in this case, we're talking email that claims to be from some sort of legitimate organization. So maybe Reader's Digest or uh, the, the Canadian government or a bank, but some sort of organization uh, that you would think is, is quite kind of reputable, legitimate, but it is not. Um, it's it's um, uh, they're, they're emulating the look of the logo. They are basically just faking um, the fact that they're from that organization and they're doing so to try and extract some sort of information from you. Maybe it's your bank account, your, your bank account number, maybe it's a, some sort of password. There, there's some sort of request made that you, you know, uh, for security purposes that you provide a password or you confirm a password. Um, or maybe they're going for something uh, a bit more kind of general, simply asking for, you know, your mailing address or a phone number. Um, the important thing though, is that um, phishing um, often involves a sort of sense of urgency or a, they're, they're, they're trying to persuade um, based on the fact that apparently you need to act quickly. Um, so in that, the hurry to answer it, um, sometimes, you know, emotions <laughs> run high and people do provide um, information, which is then later used basically to uh, pose as you and, and then from there, the, the problems start. Um, so I think I, I did just see that somebody has joined us. I, um, Ilea, did, were you able to let in Mark? I did. Great. Mark, um, I think you may be muted right now, but hello, if you can hear me. Um, so uh, we're just going over kind of the 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 basic types of of online fraud of of different types of scams, basically that people frequently encounter. Um, so I was just going over what phishing is, and and the long and the short of it is that it's uh, some sort of request for information that comes from someone pretending to be uh, a legitimate organization or representative of a bank or something like that. Um, oh, I see Jika has entered. I'm going to admit her. I'm just going to wait a sec. Hi, Jika, can you hear me? I'm going to take that as a yes. <laughs> so um, yeah, we're just going over some of the common types of online fraud and of scams. Um, so I, the, the second one um, is merchandise traps. Merchandise traps are, are basically uh, kind of snake oil salesmen in new clothing. Uh, you know, so it could be a fake website. Um, it's often some form of subscription service, uh, which is saying, you know, uh, pay for something up front uh, and, and you'll have access to uh, lower fees or perhaps it's uh, a fake kind of cell phone plan or something like that. But the, the long and the short of it with the merchandise trap is that there is something that you're seeking out that the, or you're trying to buy. Whereas with phishing, it's just sort of they're wanting information and then that's going to be used later on for malicious purposes. A merchandise trap, you know, is, is sort of dangling a carrot and saying, give us your banking info uh, and we will send you this. The, the, they often come in the form of something which on, on second glance, you'd probably think, okay, that's probably too good to be true. Or maybe that's, that's simply too cheap for what they're offering. Um, but uh, that's, that's a common one. Um, 
the third one here is identity theft. Um, identity theft is pretty closely linked to phishing, this first uh, one that we went over, in that it's just, it's using some form of information about you um, to, to uh, pose as you. And it takes, it can often go pretty far. You know, somebody, if, if someone was able to get hold of your uh, uh, social insurance number, well, and then from there, they, there's a lot of different things that they could get. And that's the real danger with identity theft is it's a sort of a slippery slope. Once somebody has one piece of information, they can use that to get more and more until they could well have quite a lot of information on you and use that um, to do things like open bank accounts and create more false ID, IDs and take out fictitious loans and so on and so on. So that, that's kind of like one of the more serious uh, forms that, that it's, it's less common, but it, it happens and it's serious when it does. Um, and then the last one, fines and threats. Um, often you'll, you'll get uh, an email that says, you know, uh, something like, uh, if you don't pay this uh, by this date, you know, we'll, we'll send uh, the Canada Revenue Agency after you or something like that. It's, uh, it's, it just has, again, often a real tone of urgency to it. Um, and blackmail is a form of this, which would be, again, taking it even further where somebody is, is threatening you and they're saying, you know, and if you don't do this, like even worse things will happen. Um, so in one case on Hide Aguai recently, someone's contacted uh, by someone claiming to be from the police um, they, in this case, even used a computer program to make it look like the local RCMP office was calling. Uh, and then this person said that they had uh, arrested someone's family member um, and that if they didn't pay, they were going to send this person to jail. So obviously, you can see how that will create a real sense of panic. Thankfully, in this case, um, the person recognized that it was suspicious and, and didn't uh, kind of submit to that person's demands, but but that's kind of uh, it, it, how, how far it can go. So on this next um, slide, we've just basically got an example straight from, uh, this is an inbox on Haida Gwaii. So somebody, <laughs> somebody on Haida Gwaii received this very uh, uh, email. Oh, hi Jika, you're waving. <laughs> hi. Um, so this is just to give you a sense of kind of how these things often read. So, okay, Mr. Williams Park, fair enough. That's uh, could be a, any anybody's name. Subject, that's that's their first kind of tell. It's subject, all caps, answer quickly. You know, there's clearly a sort of a scary undertone to this. Big, big, bold letters, answer quickly. Um, and then notice this next bit. It starts with, it's not your real name, it's, unless your name is friend. It's just generic. It's just hello friend. That would tell you, I suppose, if you're reading this, well, maybe they don't actually know who you are. And maybe this was an email that was just sent out to a ton of different people. Um, and as you read through this, and you can do that on your own time, you see again, down on the second paragraph, there's some big, big numbers being thrown around. And this is something that often happens with online fraud scams and so on. There's some mention of maybe, maybe they're saying, we will pay you a large amount of money if you do something. Or maybe in this case, they're saying, uh, we will fine you a certain amount if you don't do something. Um, in this case, they're basically saying that they, they're claiming that they would like to transfer you a little over 10 million US dollars if only you just provide some further information. So as you, if you take this as a pretty strong example of a generic phishing email, that first type of uh, online threat that I mentioned, you can see how there are quite a few suspicious elements to it. So, so just kind of treat this one as a good example. Um, so we've got a couple the next few slides are, are really just um, some tips. So th things that you can put into practice that are, uh, you know, that can help you avoid any of these things. 
The first one, which is fairly straightforward, is just to, to use a strong password. And a strong password is one that has uh, some combination of letters and numbers, and maybe even special characters like a apostrophe or a question mark or uh, things like that. Um, so when you use uh, when you use a strong password, that, so we've got some really really strong passwords on the right here. Um, when you use a strong password, you you might just base it off of a word. So in this case, you see the third one down on strong passwords. That's just a really complex way of saying cow hunter, right? So we've got a bunch of extra characters in there, but as you add in these extra characters, numbers, all this stuff, it's really just lowering the chance that anybody could ever guess that password. On the other hand, if you use a weak password, you know, something like one, two, three, four, five, six, well, it wouldn't take too many guesses uh, until someone could crack that. And once they do, you know, then they have access to all your info and so on. So I think this is just, uh, the, the first point is just try to make it a memorable password, something that, you know, you won't forget, but at the same time is, is not just letters or not just lowercase letters or not just numbers, make it a, a, some sort of combination. Uh, and, and then the second point is, Every few months, uh, it's it's a good idea uh, to probably to think about changing your passwords. Um, it's it's not a rule, uh, but I think it's it's definitely recommended. It's good practice um, to update things. Um, just think of it as kind of spring cleaning. You know, you, you every now and again you do want to just double check that nothing's been compromised, and and the easiest way to do that is to just change your password. Um, with any of these things, if it comes to you know, changing your password with email or changing your password on a social media account, if you're not comfortable doing that yourself, then you can always uh, contact one of the uh, members of the, the program team and, and I'll give you some more contact info at the end. So there's people on island who can help you um, with really any of these uh, pointers. And uh, yeah, and I guess the last thing is uh, self-explanatory, but it's it's a it's a good idea to keep your passwords to yourself. Uh, you you don't want to uh, open it up to the possibility that someone will mention it or will write it down or something like that. As much as possible, just keep it in your head and keep it to yourself. I guess. Um, a second kind of practical tip is uh, to, to check the URL. And by URL, I mean, on this, uh, the right side of the screen here, where there's a big green check, see how it says HTTPS, and then there's two dots, two slashes. And then the rest of that is the website name. When you see that, and then compare it to the bottom one, where there is no S, it just says HTTP and then two dots and so on and so on. The S in this top one basically indicates that the password, or sorry, <laughs> indicates that the website is protected. It's secure, uh, it's a trusted, uh, nice sturdy website. Um, and depending on, on what uh, web browser you're using, depending on, on how you're trying to get to that website, you might see this little uh, green padlock you might see that uh, the text itself is green and you might see nothing at all. You might just have to look at the front of it and, and see if there is that S, H-T-T-P-S. If that's the case, fantastic. It's a secure website and you know, carry on. Um, if it's not, if, if you see H-T-T-P dot dot, it could be that the website is still relatively safe it's more just uh, something to note. Um, so if you already had suspicions about the link that you're following um, or, or wherever you're trying to go, that might be a good uh, further indication that it's not the safest of websites. Um, and the other thing here is um, aside from, from looking for that, so HTTPS, aside from that, just have a look at the, the website 
URL itself. Um, oh, I'm just going to admit someone else who's showed up. Hello, Elsie, who's just showed up. I'm just going over some kind of pointers for um, how you can identify um, a website as being either safe or possibly unsafe just by looking at the actual uh, URL. That is the, the way that the website is written in your browser. So just as two kind of polar opposites, if you go to www.gmail.com, well, G Gmail is one of the bigger, uh, more commonly used, if not the most common uh, email uh, host around. So gmail.com, most people would recognize instantly as just being a safe, well-known website. If you look at www.bazoo.cn.fr, these everything after each of these dots, dot .cn, dot .fr, these are basically just fairly uncommon extensions. So dot .cn actually means that that website is uh, hosted in China and dot .fr would mean something further and so on. But as you just basically look, is it dot .com or is it dot .cn, dot .fr? And there may be even further dots. And the longer that gets, uh, it basically, the I think that, the, the more you might want to question whether it's a link you want to follow. Again, that's not a hard rule, but just something to keep in mind if you're kind of trying to, to eyeball it. Um, this one is, is pretty easy to put in practice and will come, I think, intuitively to most people. As a, a third tip for just is, you know, trying to assess whether something is from a, a trusted or a suspicious source, just have a look at the subject line or the sender name if it's coming as an email. So I've got three examples here. Um, the first one, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll kind of uh, do the great reveal right now. The first one is, is suspicious. The second one, not suspicious, probably quite legit. And the third one, suspicious. So, um, We'll just go over these quickly as to what, you know, why am I saying that this first one is a bit suspicious. So just like with that last slide where I said uh, gmail.com was a, a rather um, a common email uh, host, um, Yahoo is, but yahoo.biz.jp, again, just it's not common. Uh, that's indicating that it's a business account registered in Japan. Um, and then if you compare that again to the, the second line sender, well, hotmail.com, again, pretty, pretty common. So just by looking at the sender, you might, you might have um, some indication of whether it's safe. Looking at the subject, again, I mentioned that some of the, the, the things you commonly see with phishing, especially, is the sense of urgency or a sense that you need to act quickly or maybe there's even a, a kind of a veiled threat that if you don't act quickly, something bad will happen or you'll miss an opportunity or something. So again, with the first and the third of these email examples, there's clearly a sense that you need to do something quick. Whereas in the third one, or sorry, in the, in, or is in this, the second one uh, where it says checking in, well, but, that that's that's how people talk and people frequently just check in on one, one another through email there's no urgency no kind of uh, pushiness to it and then if if you're looking at the message itself um you know there's all sorts of, of tells in what's being said here so again the first and the third um they have uh some kind of in, in the first case uh kind of institutional weight behind them. They're mentioning it's from a bank and they're talking about transferring funds into an account. It's all quite official and it's all dealing with money and so on. Um, and the third one too, in this case, they're basically about to say, you need to do something. Uh, and if you don't, you're going to have more fines. Um, so in either case, uh, they're, they're using two different approaches, but they're, they're revealing themselves in pretty similar ways. And then the middle one though, again, like it's just, hi, mom, just wanted to see how you're doing and so on and so on. So it's more 
how people talk, how people actually do write when they're just inquiring and sending uh, an email to check up. So uh, just just kind of keep in mind these two points that you know if you don't identify if you can't immediately identify who is sending you this this message, well you know you you probably proceed with caution, and and I think above all if you if you simply don't recognize who um, an email or a message is coming from, um, and it contains some sort of link. Uh, never open that link. It could lead you any number of places, and most of them are not fun. Okay, and uh, uh, so another uh, and, and final just little uh, tip, and then I think we'll we'll kind of just wrap up with some further resources um, at the local level and the regional level, and then and then uh, and then back uh, kind of to to questions, I guess. Um, we'll just, you know, have a good half hour for, for questions from people. But so first, uh, the, the final tip, I guess, is, is these four V, the, the three Vs, vet, validate, verify. So if you, if you receive an email from an unknown sender, um, just have a look. Um, are there grammatical errors? Are there kind of common misspellings? Um, is there really anything basically to suggest that this is written by someone for either a, a mass circulation where they, they are kind of just sending this out to any old person and hoping that someone bites? Or is it a more legitimate looking message where, you know, there is actually, you know, your first name and there's specifics. Uh, they're, they really are inquiring about something that only, you know, you and someone else uh, have been recently talking about. Or So just have a look. Uh, what can you gather from the first line, hopefully, you know, without opening an email um, or without accepting a message on social media? If you can glimpse at what the, the body of the message is saying, that's your first uh uh, the first step to just sort of assessing it. Um, now, if you receive a phone call and, uh, and, and there is some sort of demand, I mean, we've all received robot calls, robo calls, where there is a, you know, the immediate sign that this is not legitimate is that it is a robotic or kind of mechanical voice. My, personally, when I receive a call of that sort, I, I don't even bother to listen to it and I just hang up and I don't think there's any harm in doing that. If it's uh, sort of uh, clearly not even a human you're talking to, well, that's a good sign that this is not a, a, a message personalized to you. It's just sort of a mass appeal and it's often uh, a part of a phishing attempt. Um, and uh, just make sure to, to remember also that depending on the organization, uh, whether it's a bank or the Canada Revenue Agency or, or, or what have you, there are certain channels that you will never be contacted through. So the government of Canada would never um, call to get uh, so-called further information from you by telephone. If they were to send you uh, anything, it would be through mail. Uh, that's their kind of preferred, more official channel. Similarly, you wouldn't simply receive a text on a cell phone uh, from uh, from uh, Canada Revenue Agency saying, please click this link to verify something. Um, they do not send out text messages as a rule, uh, as a, a matter of principle. And so um, just keep that in mind that there, there are certain channels that you will never hear from different organizations through. And if you do, that in and of itself is kind of suspicious. Um, in terms of, of resources uh, for where you can get more information on online scams and frauds and so on, um, locally, there is, of course, the iPads for Elders program. So um, that's a program that I'm involved with and that the CHN and School District 50 um, are partnering on. And the idea there is we can provide booklets. We've got uh, specialized uh, kind of short training pamphlets, you know, four pages or so. Uh, on specific topics, um, and and if you wanted to to speak with one of the the members of, of the team as well, um, you can always do that, and we can just kind of offer you some one-on-one -on -one support. Um, there's also Vancouver Island Regional Library, 
Um, they have fantastic resources. Um, and um, uh, Literacy Attic Y, likewise, Bang is on the call and I, uh, I think can kind of offer uh, some more uh, detail on, on the sort of uh, resources um, that, that they're able to offer. Um, Northern Savings, um, they deal with a lot of, uh, of online fraud because unfortunately, um, yeah, they're the sort of the port of last call when things have gone south. Um, if somebody really has become a victim of, of identity fraud and so on, well, ultimately the bank's going to need to get involved. The Northern Savings um, have a lot of experience with a, a lot of understanding of uh, the, the landscape of online fraud and, and scams. So um, don't hesitate to just reach out to them. I know that Vaughn, um, whose contact info is on the next slide, Vaughn New is um, quite happy to speak with people um, about this one-on-one. -on -one. And you know, this is just totally anonymous, but for some of these real world examples of, of, of what's going around in Haida Gwaii right now, what, what they're seeing a lot of, I think that can be fairly helpful. Um, and, and then, you know, the last line of defense, the RCMP also deal with this. So if you're comfortable going to the RCMP, and if you think that um, it's got to that point, um, if, if, if not you, it could be your neighbor. So please do go to them and report it so that um, we can catch things locally um, before they really blow up. Um, then there is finally, uh, I'm happy to send this out to anybody who's interested. Um, there is something called the Little Black Book of Scams, which is uh, <laughs> a, a resource that, you know, as the name implies, goes over all the common uh, scams. So it's it's basically going over what we've gone over in this session, but in much greater detail. It's, you know, it's a good 50 pages. Um, there's some fun illustrations in it. It's written in an accessible way. Um, but it's, it's updated yearly. And um, so that gives you an, a, a, a kind of deeper dive into some of this stuff that we've covered. And from there, um, as I mentioned, I'll open it up to questions right away. But I guess just don't be afraid to ask for help if you're having thought, you know, if, if, if you're feeling anxious about an email you've received, if you've received a text message that just doesn't feel right, if um, perhaps though, even if you've received mail, physical mail that you think is a little bit suspicious, come to any one of us that are named here, Vaughn, Bang, Patrick, or myself. Um, each of us, I think, can, ha can help you uh, just assess, is that legitimate? Is it something you should look into uh, further or just a leap on the spot? That kind of a thing. Because um, yeah, as I say, if, if not you, it, it's, it's so common that uh, I think one of the best things we can do to help is just report it, have a good idea of what's going around and then we we're better prepared. Um, so I'm going to end it there and um, Ilea, I, I think if you can allow people to unmute and stuff, I'll just keep this slide on for now, um, or I can stop sharing um, whatever you, you like. What do you think, Ilea? Thomas, um, Mark has a, a question or a comment in the chat. Okay, let's have a look. And that's a very common um, problem for a lot of elders, the scare tactic. Okay, can you what, what is his question? I'm not okay, the, that right now. okay uh, I'll read out the uh, Mark's question. I have several messages from Microsoft locking up my computer. Don't shut down. Uh, well, my computer did crash. So a situation when, uh, when, the, when the computer was hijacked. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, I guess the, the first thing there is there's a few, I think, other questions that we would need to know or have answers to before we can really say, like, what's causing that? Um, depending on the age of the computer, um, it could be that it's it's not so much a matter of a, an infected computer. It could just be that it's um, on its way out and acting in funny ways um, as they do after some time. So that, that's one possibility. If If the 
if they're coming as emails or did, did you say te texts or emails or just messages? Mark, did, did, can I mute maybe and you can explain a little bit more? He is unmuted and I'm not too sure what's going on as well as Jihai <laughs> asked everybody yeah, to yeah. unmute. Right, okay, I, I have, um, I've seen so, um, similar situations from some elders, the whole screen just got hacked, right? I mean, uh, they, it, so it's a, it's a virus really, it looks like a virus that they may have downloaded somehow already. And it just took over the entire screen when they turn on. Um, and sometimes they try to power off, they cannot power off the whole, uh, it, it's just crashed, the whole system crashed. Um, and you, they just have to send it away for repair. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or there are also situations where elders have been, um, they have received an email, they open it, and then the, um, the, the, the virus got into the computer. Mm -hmm. and, and there will be messages that says, um, please, well, the, I'm Microsoft tech, I'm a Microsoft technician, I can help you, please yeah. pay a certain amount of money. And right. of course, the elder paid up, and, and then it was, and they clean it up right on the spot, you know, like those uh, remote service that you've seen from, from computer technicians. It was cleaned up a little bit. And then the next email she received was, okay, um, looks like there's another issue again. You need to make another different payment claimed by Microsoft, right? Um, and so there were a few amounts of um, money that went through, um, but eventually, the elder realized that this looks weirder and weirder, but yeah. it, but she had to encounter three, four sessions before she really realized that she was um, scammed. Right. Well, and that's, this is, I guess, one of the reasons I would say, if ever you are asked or simply told to pay up um, for any sort of service, as a rule of thumb, if it's not a service you paid for before, um, if it's any sort of yeah, new fee, um, I would say that it is a good idea to run it by someone that you trust. Um, and that could be someone um, on this call, uh, could be any of those, those um, email addresses and resources that, that I had um, put up earlier. So uh, Patrick Seibold at Thurl, Von New at Northern Savings or, or Bang, um, just to make sure that uh, kind of to have a sec, a ba basically a second set of eyes and, and um, just run it by them. Do you think this is legit or not? Because yeah, once the problem with, um, with, with scams of the sort you're describing there, Bang, is once someone recognizes a kind of a target, so to speak, and they have some luck, you know, somebody has paid. I don't think it's uncommon at all for someone to continually receive more and more scams. And it, it gets worse because that person has now been kind of identified as someone who will pay up. And um, so, yeah, things can, can kind of spiral. I know that there were, there were, um, there, there've been some local instances where the, you know, the Sanford Fire Department um, was a victim of something pretty similar that involved a, a pretty significant transfer of money to what appeared to be a legitimate bank account. Um, so in some cases, these things can't be avoided and, and it, they are just so convincing that that's, that's kind of the issue is it's, it's really hard to tell. But um, yeah, if it's, if it's something new, you've never paid for before, just before you do anything, before you enter your credit card details, especially uh, run it by somebody that you trust um, with these sorts of things, I think. Mark, do you have other questions before I can ask others if they do? I have gotten a lot of scam calls, but I recognize them right away. Right. On, on my phone and on my internet and email. Like oh, and then, that. And it's all to do with money. I just delete them. Yeah. 
what is it can i ask what is it that you what, that makes you recognize them as scams right away well on the phone there's no name there's just numbers and on the um emails they say that you've been you inherited a whole bunch of money and that and i yeah. just recognize it and delete it yeah so i think i mean that's in the same way that you're saying you don't recognize the number or there's no name that's i guess kind of similar with the the email if you look at the name of the person it's got all those lengthy dot 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 and it's all it just keeps yeah. going it's the same idea you know like if it's, it's an, if it's a country code you don't recognize if it's just a yeah series of numbers that's suspicious i think uh, maybe it's not, but yeah, your approach to just delete it or not even answer the phone is probably smart. Anyway, good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see <laughs> you. Elsie, do you have have questions? Can you hear me at, at the moment? Yes, I can hear you. Super. The worst one I've had is when I've had a problem um, with the computer and trying to get help from Microsoft and getting one of their uh, supposedly uh, people to help me, the person was a scam mm -hmm. and tried to get into my computer and sell me a program. Right. Mm -hmm. And oh, what? So how, how did you figure out that it was not legitimate? Well, he, he, he got into my computer. This is quite a long time ago. Hmm. And, uh, and then he started to try to sell me something, a program. Right. That's when I realized this guy's a scam. Right. Now, this is... <laughs> It has happened to me again, but I didn't open because I figured. But, you know, that's difficult because you go to Microsoft for yeah. help. Right. And, and they're, they're, whoever they put you through to is not honest. Yeah. Yeah. And have you had any issues since? I had one uh, a few months ago. And actually, I could tell the voice that it was the same person. Right. And I said, well, I wouldn't buy anything from you. And he knew right away that I had recognized him. But same. I didn't afford it. Maybe I should have. I think, well, what you did there is smart. Because as soon as you basically put the ball back in their court and say, you, you know, I recognize you as a scam. Well, imagine they've got columns of people and they've got those few people that, you know, they still yet to send their messages to. And then they've got those people who they have heard back from and, and, and seem to be interested in hearing more. Well, I'll have removed you from that column at least and say, okay, it's not worth pushing any harder with her. You know, we've been found out. Let's move on to the other person. So I think just in saying that and just sort of saying, I. I know what's going on here. You've probably done some good there, and you. And I would hope that you'll hear from them less because now they they, they don't <laughs> want to waste their time. Um, the other thing is, there's a lot on the internet where um, it, websites that the system doesn't like, mm -hmm. they would uh, say that it's dangerous. Right. It's time, if you're doing research and you do get things that the system doesn't like, yeah. they will say this has a, a virus in yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Don't open. Mm -hmm. And do you mean if you're just going to a website and you're saying kind of, 
the, the website window itself just sort of has like a generic message, that kind of a thing where it says like, are you sure you want to proceed or this is an untrusted website? Is it that kind of language? Yes, and this website is false or yeah. Or, yeah. So in, in many cases, honestly, there, depending on how your system is set up, how, uh, how it's configured, it may be that it is it is true that um, that it it's an somehow a suspicious uh, insecure website that could compromise your info. Um, but you're right. Depending on your uh, your provider, depending on how things are set up, yeah, two different people using pretty similar equipment might just find that one is blocked, and and in that case, it can just I think just be a source of unnecessary worry. Um, as a rule of thumb, though, I think that's a, it's a sign that your system is working at very least. <laughs> well, on the other hand, it's very um, like it discourages you from doing research into yeah. opposite opinions. Yeah. And uh, I find that very disturbing. Mm. Yeah. And I think um, if you have. Uh, if you had a preferred, you know, music website or something like that, you can always add it to your favorites. And once it's added to your favorites, that takes care of it forever. You know, you don't have to worry about uh, links to that website being flagged in the way that they are, in the way that you're describing. Um, but yeah, I think one, one of the ways, or one of the kind of platforms you see that a lot on is probably social media. So if you're clicking Facebook links and it's directing you to uh, some news website, um, some of the news you get through Facebook is hosted on websites which are kind of less than reputable or they're hosted in, in countries far away with very different data laws and so on. And that might be why you're seeing that flag, that, that warning come up because it's something about where the information is stored. But I agree, yeah, it can be kind of annoying in the moment. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. Tomas? Yep. What's your advice to elders if their Facebook account has been hacked and it's an, it's an issue of identity theft in this case and um, Facebook messages has been sent using their name. And so, mm. yeah, what's your advice on that? That's a complicated one. <laughs> um, I think we should do an entire session on that, honestly. <laughs> um, I think that the thing not to do, and which some people do kind of instinctively, is to make another Facebook account. So be it just because one has been hacked do not start making multiple accounts because then it's going to become more and more difficult to prove to Facebook or whoever it is that you ultimately need to work through um, that you are in fact the real account owner. Um, I think if your Facebook account has been hacked, the first thing you should do is just stop and, and think is the is the password that you use for your Facebook account the same as it is for any other? So if, if you're basically recycling the same password across email, Facebook, and any other stuff, um, yeah, that's, that puts you at risk. That exposes you to a bit more danger than if you had used one and another and another, and you have unique passwords for each. So depending on the answer to that, I think that determines your next step. If you have the same password for Facebook and a lot of other stuff, the first thing you should do is change those passwords for the things that haven't yet been hacked because they might be next, who knows? Um, if, um, you know, either way, there are very kind of formal channels that you have to go through, uh, through Facebook, uh, to report uh, what they call a compromised account. And um, generally speaking, if you are able to access your main email account, um, so let's say it's Gmail, that makes life easy. 
So long as you can send them a couple emails, they might ask for your cell phone number. They're going to ask for a couple basically pieces of information to verify that you are who you say you are. You are the real, uh, you know, Ben. Um, then uh, that's that's great. Um, it, yeah. Either way, you, you you have to go through that that formal kind of Facebook process. There's a whole part of the Facebook uh, the Facebook platform which deals with security and stuff. So if that's happened, yeah, maybe contact one of us, uh, Ben, myself, um, to talk about next steps. Um, but don't make an your account and do just think, okay, what before this gets any worse. Are there any other passwords that I can be changing to kind of contain things? Is that, I think, do you have anything you would add to that, Ben? Yeah, I suppose not to use Facebook anymore until we, we help them sort it out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thomas, can we kind of compile a list of what are the next steps if, if um, situations like that have been hacked, like Elsie mentioned about, you know, um, pretend Microsoft technician. Yeah. Um, and, or, or, you know, once you have, once you've given out your credit card, what are the next steps? Call right. the credit card company, of course, and then call RCMP, file a report. So those are the more serious um, issues, but the less, I wouldn't call it less serious, but again, a, a, a smaller degree of seriousness, so-called. Um, yeah. Say your Facebook has been hacked or, or um, you cannot identify uh, from an email that it's a spam or, or, or if someone's trying to hack you go through, like you mentioned earlier on looking at the subject line, looking at the content, you know, and, and you know, if the elder is still worried, what should they do in the next step? Maybe just delete it, if, you know what I mean? Like then mm -hmm. how to delete, for example, or how to junk. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea. So a kind of a, a step by step, next steps, yeah. kind of what to do if this, that, and so on. Yeah. If it already happened. Yeah. If it's art, something. Uh, yeah. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I was going to ask also, you know, for, uh, for those on the call, if there are other ideas for uh, specific uh, yeah, specific kind of topics like that. What what would you know people find helpful? Are there any kind of real gaps that people want more info on, or are these sort of next step ideas? Do any of you have specific things you'd really you know want us to <coughs> dive deep on? Well, there's one in. <coughs> on Facebook, mm -hmm. when um, someone sends you a, a message and it has the name of a person that you know well yeah. uh, is sending this message. Yeah. And uh, fortunately, my daughter, Karen, uh, told me, don't click on those messages because you know you haven't heard from that person for years. Mm -hmm. uh, now it keeps coming back. Hmm. The this same message? message? From the same person. Right. So, um, of course, I know not to. And so right. I just need it. But yeah. I thought that maybe that happens to other people. It does, totally. <clears throat> uh, I think increasingly Facebook... Uh, their little behind the scenes uh, technology is getting better so that less and less it's happening and more and more, it, they kind of can, can filter off those, those kind of messages, things that are just like, you know, sent with the exact same wording from the exact same person every couple of months or so. It's gonna recognize that. Facebook's gonna recognize that and go like, that's probably pretty suspicious. And they'll put it into a separate inbox altogether. So I'm always surprised, you know, every couple months I'll, I'll be clicking around in my inbox and I'll realize, oh, look at that. There's, you know, four or five in a whole different inbox. Lo and behold, they are all junk. And uh, so, you know, thank you, Facebook, for getting it right. But if they do slip through and you do actually see the message, it's in your regular inbox waiting to be read. Yeah, I think um, 
if you can just recognize that, take, yeah, take a step back. Great advice from your daughter in this case. You know, if you haven't heard from this person in 20 years, uh, and especially if it starts with uh, uh, a misspelling of your name, or if they don't even say anything at all, and they just say like, hello, pal, or something quite generic, where it doesn't even seem like it's, you know, intended for you, <clears throat> like instantly delete that. Uh, there's n there's nothing to be lost from them. If if it was legitimate and they really needed to contact you after all these years, they'll send something else and maybe it'll be a bit more personalized this time. <laughs> but I think that's a good yeah, that's that's uh, something yeah good to point it out. And and Jika or, or Mark. Um, are there other things that, that we haven't gone over or, or things like that you've experienced that you think, you know, perhaps that's worth talking about more? Oh, I can't hear you, Jika, but I can see that you're trying to talk. <laughs> Oh, hold on. Let's see if I can unmute you. Ilya, can you unmute Jika? I'm having a hard time. Oh, there. Oh, there we go. What the heck? Did you have to unmute me? Nope, you got that one. That was all you. Um, I can hardly wait for you to see my grandson's creation. <laughs> he, he made his own computer. No way. Yeah, and it's colors. Oh, wow. Different colors come up. Cool. It all lights up. Yeah, it's really neat. And I was thinking about you um, saying um, about our passwords. Uh -huh. We're elders and we forget the passwords. I know. And this is a fun, this is out of a catch 22. On the one hand, the best thing would be to write it down so that you don't forget it, right? And that, that I think a lot of people do that anyways. You know, they just write passwords and then they stick it to the fridge or something like oh, that. I got sure. a little book. Yeah. Okay. You got, yeah, a little diary or something. That's, that's a, it's a good way of making sure you don't forget. But, Vaughn from uh, Northern Savings pointed this out to me because I was going to suggest that and, and I'm thankful you brought this up. He pointed out to me if you go and write down your passwords and put it on your fridge or something and then you were to be a victim of fraud because you've written down your password you know legally it could be that the bank is no longer on the hook because technically you have shared your password. You know, there's no telling who have, has seen that at some point, or there's no no knowing, did you write down your password and then misplace the paper itself? Did somebody else get hold of it? <clears throat> and from the bank's perspective, that changes everything. So it's a funny one where I would say, yeah, to avoid forgetting it, write it down. So it's, it's going to be a judgment call, really, for each person. Um, but, you know to really avoid any trouble hopefully it is something you can remember uh, and just keep in memory um but if that's simply not possible then yes i think you you should be writing things down could I is it a okay? password book y yeah yeah sorry elsie is it okay to put it on a stick and it's separate from your computer a stick as in a usb stick yeah I'm not sure what I would recommend there because fair enough if you can remember where you put that USB stick. But if I find that USB stick, I've still got all your stuff. And it's almost no better. It's maybe it's a little bit safer. It's a little bit further removed, but I'm not sure. Um, it's certainly I'll tell you what, if you could if you had a USB stick and you could guarantee that you remember a password to that USB stick then fair enough. But if it's just a USB stick that all you have to do is plug it in and 
bang, bang, boom, there's a, a Word document or something that says Elsie's passwords. Like we're, <laughs> we're not much better off. But um, I'm, I, yeah, as I say, it's, it's going to be a matter of you're going to have to judge for yourself, really. If you're comfortable doing that and that's a system that you know you will remember, do it. Um, but just be mindful of that uh, little nugget of wisdom from Vaughn. Uh, that it's yeah apparently um mark i'm, I'm not sure if if uh, you have questions I, I can see when you type um questions mark in the chat and i can read them out that way if you did have any um any questions otherwise i think we'll maybe need to wind things down maybe we have about five more minutes but i think um that will Bang, bang in the meantime, while we're possibly maybe waiting for Mark to type something. Do you, do you have anything you want to add? No, just a little bit more about the password, I suppose. I mean, password, something to, to consider is, um, like you said earlier on, don't use the same password for your Gmail account, your Hotmail account, and your Facebook account. Uh, but again, that creates problems for elders too, because you have to remember so many passwords, right? Your passcode for your iPad, for example, and then your password for your Apple ID, and then your password for your banking. And, and so that, that becomes a very long list. And to remember all the different passwords, let alone, let alone thinking that one password is for something else. And when you have to reset your, your Gmail account, the password is a little bit different from, from your password for your Facebook or something like that. So it, it, it can create a lot of confusion. What I find useful um, for myself, because I'm an <coughs> iPad user, there's a, um, there's, a pass, um, there's a password feature in iPads for those iPad users and iPhone users. Um, that could be a, a, a way that you can put in all your passwords in there and it uh, and you use your thumbprint, for example, or your passcode to, to unlock. Um, that is your E, what I call the E diary. But if for those who are more keen on writing diaries, again, it's like keeping your diary secret. <laughs> you write down your passwords in there, all the different passwords, and then put it somewhere put it somewhere else and not put it on the fridge, for example, and mm -hmm. not expose it in, in public, so-called. Um, but if you reset, then I would advise really scratch out or cancel the old one. Otherwise, you'll have a list of new pa different passwords for Facebook, for example, and not remembering when you set it or reset it. <laughs> right. Yeah, and write down a uh, reset on a particular date, at least putting little reminders to yourself mm -hmm. when you reset a particular password. Yeah. So you can identify which one is more updated, for example. Yeah, good advice. Um, I'm, I, saw, I saw from Mark, um, no, he doesn't have any, any kind of further questions, so that's cool. Um, if um, everyone if wants to just sort of uh, take a quick note. Oh. On one second, I'm just gonna share those, um, uh, share those contact details with you one more time. Okay, so from beginning, I'll just go all the way to the end. There we are. So if you can if you can just take a note of, of any of these four uh, emails, that's a good starting point for any further questions you'd have. So the first one is mine. It's long, but iPads for elders at Museum.ca. I think start there. Um, I can point you in the, the right direction if nothing else. Um, and, and Patrick at, at Burl. Vaughn at Northern Savings and Bang, who's on the call with us. Everybody has their, their own kind of uh, specialisms that they can help you with. Um, Bang is a fountain of knowledge. So, um, and, and I know is, is all always willing to help. So 
yeah, just maybe make a note of these. And, and yeah, if there's no further questions, what, as I say, we'll, we'll record this. We're going to put it on the uh, CHN website. Um, Ilea, will it also be shared just straight through Facebook or how are we going to do that? I can share it on the Facebook page. Okay, cool. So on, on the, the main CHN Facebook page? Yeah, but that will likely happen by tomorrow. Okay, cool. So um, yeah, for those of you who are on Facebook, I think everyone here is, um, just keep an eye out for that. And um, yeah, please just send me an email. We'll stay, stay in touch so that we can let you know about other sessions because we will we'll make a, a habit of this and uh, on other topics. Okay, well, unless you have parting thoughts, Ilea, that's all for me. And thank you guys so much for, for joining. And uh, I hope you learned something. Thank you, Tomas. Yes, thank, thank you for you. holding that. Thanks, Ilea. Thank Thanks, Ilea. Thank Okay, nice to see you, Elsie, and uh, nice to hear from you, Mark. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Bye. Thomas. Bye.